Here comes an order of 800 board feet of hard maple. And this is for 16 restaurant tables that we need to make. I'm uh, removing the dust so that way there's the maximum amount of friction. What's up, brother? Go a little more this way. All right. Let's start there. So it's either gonna go well or it's not. Now back up. Now you can go forward. That works. So now that this lumber is in, uh, gotta find somewhere to put it on the rack there. <laughs> it's a classic. This maple cost three dollars and forty-five cents a board foot, and I had to buy eight hundred board feet to do this. Now the order is only gonna roughly take about six hundred board feet, so you gotta kind of eat the cost on that one. Time to get all this stuff on the rack, somehow. Okay, so the next step there is to actually like cut it to length and then also do a, a rough rip. Probably six inches, maybe five and a half. It kind of depends on uh, what the average, you know, halfway point is on those boards. Got a lot of work to do. Stay tuned. So Tyler upgraded the joiner from one horsepower to five horsepower. Show the mods here. With the, uh, here, that was the mod. I'll give it a little angle. And we have over a hundred boards to joint. Here's the eight footers. Here's the seven footers. Here's the four footers. Now let's get to work. My camera wasn't recording when uh, I was ripping it off, but believe me, every piece went through the table saw. And there we go. S4S pile of short tables, S4S pile of long tables, and now we'll get to the glue up. If you want to make bulletproof tables, there's three steps. You build the table flat, you reinforce it, and you finish it right. We already built the tables flat. This means face joining, edge joining, planing, then ripping. 
you glue it up over there on the JLT, and then still take it to a CNC and have them reflatten it one more time. This is going to ensure a perfectly flat table. Bam! Super flat. But this table will still want to move. And that's why you reinforce it with C-channel. Why does it still move? Well, here in Florida, we have heat and humidity. Both of those make wood move a lot. So, C-channel is essential. So for the legs of the C-channel, which are these right here, We like to use this one inch by quarter inch router bit um, by Bosch. It has these little markings right there to let you know how deep you're going. With a three quarter inch leg, you're going to want to go one inch deep. And that's to leave room for the washer, screw, and the little bit of meat you have on the flat part of the C-channel. So the quarter inch by one inch takes care of the legs of the C-channel. And the two inch flattening bit takes care of the middle here. But the first thing we want to do is cut this all to its final dimension. Now that we have these tables cut to size, I'm going to mark out where the C channel is going to go. These tables are 24 inches wide and I'm using 22 inch C channel. So that way I get maximum protection here. On my square, I have three points punched out. Now these are the respective lines where my router is going to run along to cut the holes in the right place. I'll show you what I mean. I like to put the C-channel three inches away, right here. And then, because we're at 22 inches on a 24 inch table, we're going to go an inch from one side. So the next thing I like to do is mark out exactly where it's going. Now you want to give this whole thing about a sixteenth of an inch either way for clearance. Now let's do it here on this side. So three inches, take your C channel, we're going to go one inch away on this side, which would be about right, then I mark my C channel. Because I don't want to go too far past the leg. It'll look cleaner. Well, that's about it. Doesn't have to look clean down here, but we like it looking clean. Now you're going to take these three marks here. I have them punched out on both sides. And then you line your square up with the inside leg. So I have the square set up right there and right there. And then I'm going to mark these three punch holes. Bam, bam, bam. These are going to be the legs. And this is going to be the middle meat. With your router running, running along these lines, you'll cut here, here, and then the middle, most likely. Now, this probably ain't the right way to do it. And she gets feisty because this wide bit is already at depth. So the way to like properly sink this in, if you're not trying to hurt yourself, is to like corner it and work your way into it. And then once you're flat, you can cut either way and you don't have to worry about it. Now let me show you. So this is what you're left with. Two lines and then your meat cut out right here. And see, we still have these like spikes and we want to straighten that up. Simple enough, hammer and chisel time. So we square these up.
All right, the next step is locking the C-channel down. I'm gonna use six flange washers, stainless steel, and six stainless steel one-inch screws. And it's important to countersink them or else you might break a screw. You still might break a screw, but this, this helps. Kind of gauge where it's gonna go. Solid. All right, that's the C channel. Now I'm going to get to focusing. Have you ever face jointed s 4 s them properly, glued them up, and then you came out the next morning and them suckers were warped, cupped, something was wrong with them? And you're surprised, you say, what in the world? Why did that happen? Well, maybe you didn't stack and stick your projects. We, all of these have C-channel already. But we've learned over time, stack and stick, especially all the time. After it's finished, it's a lot safer, but I still do it because uh, better safe than sorry. But look, I got all of them stacked and sticked. Pretty much proportional. I guess I have that stick off, so this bottom one might bend a little bit. Let's see how we're at. Not good to go. And number two, whenever possible, vapor barrier on the bottom, vapor barrier on the top. It makes a difference. If you've been following the channel for a while, you kind of know that we use UV polymers and that's because we think they're the best. So one of the things I need to do now is hang our new UV lights. These right here are our new UV lights. And I'm gonna give them a little shout out because they're really good lights for the price, right? This was the first light we knew and this is $1,000. Um, what you need to do with this light is pass it over about this far, about at this rate, and you will cure like a vesting's finish instantly. But $1,000, inch and a half by inch and a half. Now for 400 bucks, you can do 36 square feet at a time. But these need to be hung five feet above your project. So that's what we'll be figuring out today. I think I'm gonna have to use some cedar, 10 foot about there. That's about 10 foot, it's 12 foot. Let's see what I got here. So here we go. This is the engineering marvel that is my light hangers. Will it dip down? Let's find out. Oh, it didn't even move. So now, I guess let's see how strong it is. Seems sketch. Well, would you look at that? Stronger than I anticipated, ah, which is great. There we go. And then five feet up, huh? It's having a tough time figuring out how I was gonna wire it, but this yellow cord happens to be the perfect length. 
There's no way this is gonna be enough light. So what makes a good table? Well, for starters, a good table is beautiful, flat, strong. But you know what tables really stand out? The ones that have been around forever. For a table to last forever, not only does it need to be milled flat, probably the most important part after you do everything else is the finish. A really good finish is beautiful, super strong, and flexible because wood is gonna move. And this brings me to my little demonstration today on how we achieve a bulletproof finish. That means waterproof, scratch proof, and beautiful. What more can you ask for? I've already done this, is sand your piece to 80 grit. First thing we're gonna do is two coats of clean armor. This is wood 705 exterior clear coat mat. We'll just take our roller and we spread it out. So this first coat of clean armor is arguably the most important part of the whole process. Clean armor will get real deep into the wood fibers and that's what you want. It, it kind of acts as like a surface hardener. So maple, already a hard wood, gets even harder when you put clean armor in it. And so that's why you see me putting so much because the wood will soak all that in. So I'm gonna hit the edges now with the excess. So I'm just rolling it again just to uh, resaturate any dry areas. Because again, I wanna let this soak in pretty good. We're gonna take a rag and we're gonna wipe all of the excess off. Now, if you notice something, I like to do everything with the grain. It just makes sense. Wipe all this stuff off. All right, always make sure to wipe clean this underneath edge. It, it always, you're gonna have at least one drip somewhere. So I'd do two passes. Okay, first coat's in, we're gonna cure it. So over here, I'm just gonna plug in my overhead lights. Um, they are two model 100s from Kuvo Lighting. And uh, each one does a six by six spread. And then we just have to wait two minutes for this clean armor to be fully cooked. However, the overhead lights do not cure the edges because clean armor is directional, just like any other uh, UV cure system. So I'm gonna use my old Vesting's light to hit the edges. Now, if you have one of these little lights, you can use it to cure the clean armor. So I'm going to do three laps like this to make sure that the clean armor is fully cured. That had to be two minutes. We'll see if this top is dry. Look at that. Dry. Now, if you didn't have the overhead lights, but you have a light from Amazon or from, um, you know, one of these handhelds from Chimavir, you can cure the clean armor like this. Just like you would cure Chimavir, it works. You just gotta watch out for uh, overcooking it. Cause if you cure clean armor too fast, you'll have problems. I'm thinking I'm gonna put another light here in between them and then one more three foot off this way so I could do 12 foot tables. So now we're gonna take 120 grit and we are going to just hit the face and that is just to deburr it. There's a fine layer of white dust that you want to pick up and like rags and all that stuff that's it's not sustainable so tape a paintbrush around a vacuum head and become a cnc machine
Another thing I'm gonna do is hit those outside edges, I guess with some 180, because I have this lying around. I should have done that before I vacuumed, but that's okay. We can do it again. Okay. Luckily, this time it's not gonna take nearly as much as the first time. Now, you don't wanna overdo it on this coat because you're gonna be wiping a lot of it off because from the first coat of clean armor, I think the wood gets sealed like 70% or something. Like, it, maybe more, you know, but it, it gets pretty sealed. But then this second coat really just takes it the rest of the way. Now, what this does is gives the wood a glass-like texture. A plastic texture is not what you're going for. You want to go for a glass texture. That is what people like to feel. People don't like to feel plastic. Like people like to either feel the wood or they want it to feel like glass. Now these are going in a restaurant, so they're not going to get a choice of feeling the wood because they want these things to last forever and look beautiful forever. And so this is what we're doing. Giving them um, a mat, Real thin, but really strong finish coat. Now it's really important that you wipe all of this off. You don't want any of this excess on there. You know, I think it's soaked enough now. And the better you wipe this bottom edge, the less sanding, touch up sanding you'll have to do when you flip over. Because we're gonna do this whole bottom side complete, like fully done, so when we, f we only have to flip it over once because old boy's back can't handle all the flips. What you see is what you get with clean armor. So you see, if you see lines before you dry it, that is what is gonna happen. And this next time, when we sand it, it's actually gonna be a whole different ball game because the clean armor is super hard, flexible and self-healing. That is like the worst on abrasives. Okay, I'm gonna cure it. Now this coat will be noticeably smoother than the first coat. And that's because you deburred the first coat, but this will still have some burrs on it. You know, like each one of these is essentially popping the grain again as it cures, whatever grain is exposed. I'm gonna be repeating all of this on the top side as well. All right, now we're, we're definitely, definitely sealed and uh, we're gonna sand this again. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, let's put this back on the charger. Always put it back on the charger. All right, now that that's done, we are gonna take our sander again with 220. We're gonna do just another quick run over the top, making sure to deburr everything. We're gonna hit these edges with some thousand grit because it really doesn't need that much. Now we're going to want to remove our dust again. Now it's time to use some of this, some Chimavir. It's basically the polish for this clean armor. Like this is already a scratch proof, good to go finish. The clean armor is what's going to give it that glassy, smooth, dry feel. And the vestings is what's going to polish it. It's kind of akin to, you know, it, it's a wax, right? They, they say hard wax oil. So we're gonna put some of this down. A lot of people would have already been happy with this clean armor just the way it sits. Just saying, but. Now, we leave this coat on nice and thick. Well, it's actually really thin, but, cause like we polished it on, but we wanna, we don't wanna wipe this coat off. Cause this is the coat that's like leveling out the small little scratches in the clean armor and the small little cracks in the clean armor. So you wanna leave this one thick. You, this will cure by itself with these lights. The company didn't tell me that though. Vestings didn't tell me that and Clean Armor didn't claim that they'll cure any other UV cures. Um, the Clean Armor lights are specifically designed for Clean Armor. That being said, you can smell when the Vestings is getting cured. Like when you run the light and right now I'm smelling it, a lot of it. And, it, and it's not toxic, so that's good. But I have this handheld. Oh, you hear that? That's the trash. I missed the trash. Missed trash day. That's okay. We're going to cure it. So now for certain, this 
face is waterproof. It is now 100% guaranteed waterproof. You know, now it is a non-permeable membrane, and that's what you want. We're gonna take a thousand grit, and with the direction of the grain, we're gonna hit both ways. Well, not here. This doesn't get the direction of the grain. Pain in the butt. But you wanna go both directions everywhere you hit. It's super key. This is the step that makes anything baby, baby smooth. This is what makes water super beat up, this step right here. Like, something can be waterproof, but the water not beat up on the surface. This is what makes the water beat up on the surface. We're gonna vacuum all that dust off, or you know what, I'm gonna hit the edges again, might as well. Now that we got all of our dust off, oh, she's so smooth, but she's not done. All right, she's super smooth, but she's not done. Now we're not gonna apply any more product, we're just gonna use our kind of wet buffer, because you don't want to apply much here, because you're gonna wipe it, everything off. But this is just to polish the vestings one more time. And now they're guaranteed hundo, hundo percent waterproof. Hundo mundo right here. All right, we're gonna put this back in safety over here. I have a black trash bag over yonder where I put all of my tools in so they don't cure. All right, now this is where you wanna take all that excess off. And there's not much there, but there is excess there. You'll like, the first three or four passes, you'll be like, wow, this is dry, this is pointless, but it's not pointless. So yeah, see a little bit, a little bit comes off. This is the final, final, this is super final. You don't get more final than this. Again, I like to go directional, because if anything cures that, you know, you don't catch and you went directional, no one's gonna notice it. If you go against the grain, everyone's gonna notice it. This is the bottom of the table, so you know, I don't know if it matters too much, but the bottoms of our tables look as good as the tops. Honestly, they look better with the C-channel there. It's like, ugh, C-channel. We have wiped all the excess off. Now we're gonna cure this again. I like to turn my overhead lights on as well. Remember, with the grain, first pass, of the light uh, perpendicular to the grain on the second pass with the light. Now this here is a fully finished, 100% waterproof, 100% scratch proof, baby smooth, like scratch, 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 no scratches. I mean this right here, this is money maker. This is, this is waterproof, I mean, Look how that water beads up. That is what you're looking for. That kind of bead up, if that happens like a granite countertop, then you are good to go. If that doesn't happen, you are not good to go. Okay, so today is delivery day. The restaurant closes at like six or something. So we're getting there at seven o'clock p.m. and we're going to deliver all of those tables. Right now, I'm getting all the bases prepped. So that's getting the feet onto the columns and then the table mounting plates on top of those here and installing all of the adjustable feet.
Yeah, you can listen to my last one. You did a fantastic job. These are great job. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you. Leo. <laughs> Leo, did you did you spill this chocolate milk? Yeah. Okay, let's wipe it up. Okay. So here, let me let me finish it and I'll give it back. Look, there's more chocolate milk here. Look at that, dude. Ah. Oh. Thank you.